Good morning. I'm pleased to be able to give my second and final President's Address. Today, I'll touch on these issues listed here. And as you see, this year's meeting will be such a different meeting from any of the preceding 75 annual meetings of BAUS. Traditionally, our annual meeting is usually held in English summer, late in June, and we're very much for looking forward to coming back to the regenerated and vibrant city of Birmingham. We last visited Birmingham in 2000. We'd all worked hard to choose a central location with excellent, excellent conference, hotel and hospitality venues. However, an impossible gate crasher arrived and plans were altered. As you've seen, if you attended yesterday or are about to attend, this year's meeting is going to be in a completely different format, all virtual via an exciting media platform. It's delivered via a very interactive and user-friendly platform. And the take has been larger than any meeting in recent history. At the time of recording this, we've had over 1,500 registrants who I'm sure have taken advantage of the free registration. I think this is a very good move in terms of future use of this technology and maybe it will increase our geographical and demographic reach and allow people who are on call or in further parts of the UK or abroad to join in the meeting. Our industry partners have been very supportive in uh, continuing with their sponsorship, even though this is a virtual meeting and our venue, the ICC in Birmingham, has been extremely helpful and will be our venue for BAUS 2022, hopefully face-to-face. Uh, as ever, to make a meeting run this smoothly, there's an awful lot of work to get to this point, and there are many people I've got to thank, but the main ones really are Asif, Ian, Harry and Louise, who have worked tirelessly to ensure such a vibrant programme, especially Louise, who she's working from the uh, BAUS office we've opened in Australia. There are also the trustees, sections, abstract markers, speeches, speakers and indeed participants to thank for keeping the meeting on track, relevant and vibrant. Thank you. This year we'll also be celebrating this year's medal and prize winners and I'm delighted to announce the recipients of the St Peter's Medal is Prokar Daskupta, the St Paul's Medal Peggy Pearl, the Bouse Golden Medal Simon Harrison, the, the uh, uh, Carl Storz Golden Telescope Chris Harding and the John Anderson Award Tamsin Greenwell. Very many congratulations to these truly worthy recipients and I'm only sorry I can't be there in person to hand these awards over. Well done. The well, usual format of the Bowes President's Address at these annual meetings it takes, the usual, takes this form. It's a review of the past year's events, recognition of those who contributed, a formal handover to the next President, and is usually followed by citations and presentations of the St Peter's and St Paul's Medal. Unfortunately, due to the absolutely unpredictable events since 2019 in Glasgow, the defining issue really of 2020 and most of 2020 has been the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm going to cover this initially first, just to get this covered and essentially uh, would like to just set the scene about COVID-19 in the UK. It now seems inconceivable that there was a world in which COVID-19 wasn't with us. It's increasingly difficult to remember how our lives used to be. So I put together some key points about the pandemic and looked at it in terms of what was happening in the UK generally to contextualise the medical and neurological aspects of the pandemic and what BAUS did and how we responded. Unbelievably, the first report of a cluster of cases of pneumonia in China was registered with the World Health Organization on the very last day of 2019. The first UK case was at the end of January and the nationwide lockdown was announced on the 23rd of March 2020. This is less than six months away from, from now. The Prime Minister Boris Johnson became ill and was admitted to hospital on the 5th of April, including a spell on ITU. The worst day so far of the pandemic was on the 10th of April, uh, and almost a thousand deaths uh, had occurred on that day uh, and realisation that the emergency service could not continue indefinitely resulted in a plan uh, for recovery from lockdown and this was announced on the 11th of, well this was mooted on the 11th of May. The lockdown which started on the 23rd of March wasn't lifted until the 4th of July when pubs, restaurants and hairdressers could reopen but not all of the UK, Leicester being one city still in a local lockdown. Spring and summer uh, lockdown was fortuitously in very good weather, and this made it more tolerable for those lucky enough to have access to outdoor space. But the beaches did become very crowded, were often full to capacity and beyond. After slowing down of infections, it was noted in September this year, after the exam results and the U-turn and fiasco, that the R number was increasing again above one for the first time since March. As I record this, it looks like we might possibly be headed into a further lockdown, but in much less pleasant weather. The NHS 
track and trace system has not really been that successful and misplaced 23,000 positive cases, which were later added. Currently, we're on a three-tier system of lockdown levels and Wales in common with France and Germany have gone for a further countrywide firebreak lockdown. As if three levels were not difficult enough, Scotland will go to a five-tier system in the near future. And whatever happens, it looks like the virus will be with us for a while. And this year, Christmas is unlikely to be uh, the normal Christmas that we usually enjoy. That was a general picture in the UK and what was happening in our healthcare system. Well, this pandemic without doubt has been the biggest challenge seen in a generation. And although there were huge differences in the severity of the situation within the country, the NHS was in danger of becoming completely overrun. Some doctors were told that jobs would be changed beyond all recognition, for example, helping to prone seriously ill patients on ventilators or planning to work in specially built Nightingale hospitals. The logistic challenge in combination with not being part of some European wide deals to buy PPE was a concern and rationing was a real possibility. All elective surgery was postponed. Amongst all this, frontline healthcare care workers were becoming very ill or dying. It's difficult to estimate, but apparently almost 650 UK health and social care workers have died due to the pandemic, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Many providing urological care became very sick. I'd like to note particularly Mr. Abdul Chowdhury, who works as a consultant at the Homerton Hospital, who uh, died whilst giving uh, caring for his patients of COVID-19. Our deepest and sincere, cond sincere condolences go to his wife, Rihanna, son Intasar, daughter Warisha, wider family, friends and colleagues. Amongst all that was happening in the UK and within the healthcare system, we realised that Bausch should respond to all these challenges quickly, specifically and sensitively, and guide our members and our patients in the best way we could. This was not easy due to the rapidly changing landscape and a huge amount of effort by the trustees and executive resulted in at least weekly Zoom meetings and much work in between. The Bowes website was key for getting this information out quickly and the editor Nigel Bullock was always available and really helped organise this well. Thank you. How did we help? Well, I'll set out a few examples of this work. On the 17th of March, uh, it was announced that all NHS England hospitals to, were to suspend all non-urgent elective surgery. Less than 48 hours later, we had, thanks to work by colleagues and guys at St Thomas's, published a guide as to how to prioritise the work and guidance in which cases should be cancelled and which should not. To some extent, that was a relatively easy bit in retrospect. As I previously alluded to, PHE had produced some guidelines as to what PPE was appropriate in certain settings. A lot of our members and other uh, organisations thought the advice was perhaps being informed partly in, by the uh, reported UK-wide shortage of PPE. I'm not happy about the recommendations. The rumours of staff being able to get the correct PPE, but being encouraged to continue working without it. Therefore, BAUS produced guidance uh, on this on the 25th of March, and it must be remembered the lot that was unknown about possible methods of transmission. A lot of us not, didn't believe the heavy droplet theory, and subsequently it's been proven that this was the case, and that aerosol transmission is possible. Another concern of uh, transmission of the virus was in diathermy smoke uh, or uh, laparoscopic aerosols. And on the 26th of March, the Joint Royal Colleges uh, came up with some advice that general surgery should proceed, should be stopped in terms of laparoscopic and robotic surgery. Many urologists suspect this was not risky uh, in urological procedures where the gut isn't opened. And so on the 30th of March, we published the sparse literature that there was and the evidence there was to help give our members a balanced view and get some units returning to urology procedures more quickly. As I said earlier, closing down elective surgery is relatively easy. It quickly became apparent that there would have to be a plan to reintroduce the non-emergency work and uh, to clear the backlog. Bouse therefore constructed a very comprehensive return to elective surgery by all our sections and fed this into the FSSA document, which formed the basis for the NHSE document, which was uh, commissioned on the 28th of March via Professor Derek Alderson, then president of the Royal College of Surgeons of England. There were some contentious areas, but the sections, trustees and many members really pulled together and I'm particularly indebted to Asif Munir, Shashi Nagarwal, David Thomas, Ian Pearce, Ben Shalikam, Darren Smith, Sheila Reid and Mad Shabir for all their hard work and efforts. Here 
is the website with all the information that we published uh, on the 11th of uh, May. And you can see it's in a drop down menu form, and this is still available on the website. There was an awful lot of advice from many different sources, so we decided, being surgeons, to combine this in one simple document. And the return uh, to uh, re the return to elective surgery or the recovery phase is distilled into a four page document with each of the sections having one page. And this is still on the website. To try and make this more accessible and interactive, we took BAUS on its first steps into, into the webinar world. And in May, hosted by the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh, we had a webinar on this very topic, how to uh, transition to the new uh, normal. It was a successful 75 minutes, attended by over 500 delegates and still, still available to watch on the internet. With increasing reliability on remote meetings and technology, we thought we would devote a session to this and so held the first joint SIU BAUS webinar. This was also in May. I'm very grateful to Dan Burke, V. Mogdil and Nehesira, who are excellent faculty from BAUS. Also on the BAUS website are two excellent video videos, which I recommend uh, that you look at. And these are by Archie Fernando and Tom Thompson on how to have uh, teleconference and video conference uh, conversations and consultations with patients. Well done. As well as the guide on priori prioritisation, we realised that a lot of urologists were asking about how we should alter the way we consent patients in the COVID era. And we addressed this by an excellent document which was accepted and adapted also by ENT and vascular colleagues amongst others. A statement was also produced to, to highlight the risks faced by vulnerable groups and recommending occupational health assessment and, to ref and for members to refuse if they felt uneasy with what they're being asked to do and the degree of protection conferred to them. Moving away now from COVID, many other projects started before the pandemic and now starting to bear fruit. Chris Harding and all the FNU section have handled the mesh crisis excellently throughout and on the 8th of July uh, reported their latest comments on the Cumberledge report. It seems to plot a very sensible and measured way ahead and it's sensitive to the mesh injured patients and a credit to Paris. Roland Rees, just about every UK penile prosthetic surgeon and the andrology section commented on the NHS England plans for super centralisation of penile implantation. Originally it was suggested that there were only uh, three or four English centres and this would we felt would have been unworkable and so now they've changed uh, uh, their mind, listened to advice and are proposing to, uh, proposing to announce 10 to 12 geographically based uh, English centres and we await uh, ratification of that. Since the last AGM in September, BAUS is now able to appoint non-urologists as trustees, which is a good move following years of discussion. And the Education Committee, Audit Steering Group and Research Committee are all progressing well. Tim's talk, setting out the future projects of BAUS tomorrow, I'm sure will outline all the future projects, so I won't go over that. But I will say that BSOT is now well and truly integrated in the fabric of BAUS. It's truly fantastic to work with such a vibrant member of the BAUS family and excellent cross-communication integration has resulted. The emergency document, which was published just before last year's annual meeting, has now received much feedback and is, uh, is proving to be quite a useful tool. As GERF moves on to its next phase under the joint leadership of Kieran Flynn and John McGrath, I'm sure there'll be more work in this direction. The huge impact this year's pandemic has had on our trainees cannot be underestimated. We work closely with the SAC and the JCIE and the Intercollegiate Board of Neurology to try and produce a sensible and fair workable solution to these uncertain times. Harry Rattan with Harry and Louise produced an excellent virtual revision course and a learning program allied to the curriculum. As I record this talk, the intention is still for the FRCS Urology exam to go ahead in Edinburgh face to face in mid-November and a lot of BAUS members will be involved in that on both sides of the Green Bays. Originally designed, designed to coincide with the 2020 celebration of all things urological, which we'll talk about later, we got involved with a joint project with ITM Productions to make a 60 minute special programme with some of our industry partners to showcase urology as a career. And I'm pleased to learn that the filming for that, which had been delayed, has now been done. The BAUS executive and staff have really adapted to working well from home, much to their credit, and are starting to move gradually back into Lincoln's infield and eventually the Barry building once that extensive refurbishment has completed. That's slipped slightly right and it's now gone from 2020 to 2021 and perhaps 2022. 
As previously mentioned, 2020 is a landmark year for many UK urological organisations. I was keen to mark this, starting with planning as far back as 2017. The rolling events of this year have not happened, but I'm sure that in the future we will revisit this synchronicity and look back on the history of all the associations which make UK urology a really powerful force. The recent crisis has made this wish, if anything, stronger. The commemorative hardback book written by my colleague and curator of the Bass Museum, Jonathan Goddard, is now in an advanced stage of production and will be available to all members free of charge in the near future. Over the last two years, Baus has made and strengthened many links with various national organisations, and I list some of them here. The work is always ongoing, and the new ways of working will probably make a lot of the meetings more productive and more able to be called at short notice if needed, which is a good thing. The links are stronger uh, when those involved have met face to face, so hopefully we will see some return back to normality in 2021. One of my favourite and I feel most useful links has been with the Federation of Surgical Specialty Associations. This is a unique organisation and has a strength of representing all surgeons in the UK, irrespective of their speciality, grade, location or college affiliation. It meets equally with all the four Royal Colleges of Surgery of the UK and Ireland and also works with NHS England, NSIP, GERFT, etc. I was fortunate enough to be elected president of this for the next three years and will obviously remain impartial where urology is concerned. It is worth remembering that the FSSA website also has a surgical prioritisation guide which is updated monthly to help NHS trusts and management through the path to restoring elective surgery equitably between specialities. Nigel Mercer, the immediate past president, put this together and uh, did a huge amount of work on this and st is still doing so. As well as working closely with many national bodies, my particular aim over the last two years has been to engage more widely with international urological associations. This has paid dividends and I'm sure will continue to improve in future. When the EAU had its spring meeting in 2017 in London, it was only with careful liaison with the EAU that we managed to avoid duplication with our meeting and uh, the annual meetings were set on a new, more, I think, more successful course. The links between the Urological Society of India and BAS will see an exciting exchange of four trainees annually between each nation, centred on the annual meeting. And we've brought uh, Scandinavian friends into the fold by having them join us at the annual BAS BJUI USANS meeting at the AUA. Sri Lanka 2019 was a highlight, and the palpable friendship between the two societies is strong, and hopefully, we will be meeting them again in 2021. Speaking of the future, my talk would be remiss without mentioning these two people. Unlike the uh, Netflix Roy family, they are exciting but hopefully stable, stable times ahead for Bass. I'm really pleased that I've handed over in late June the presidency to Tim O'Brien. I'm extremely grateful for his support as vice president and with his boundless enthusiasm, he's already introducing new ideas and schemes since he took over. I'm sure he'll steal a bounce to even higher peaks of achievement. And I know he'll be very well supported by a new Vice President, Joe Creswell. I wish them both extreme, all the best and Bouse will be in safe hands. Colleagues in other associations also often state that urology leads the way in many aspects. This is no reason for complacency, but we are one of the most organised and proactive specialties. Good examples of our strengths are mentioned here, but I think the real strength of our speciality lies in our people. We're only able to do all these things because of the ideas, enthusiasm and input from so many colleagues, often in their spare time, which as you know is a precious commodity, and who have a can-do attitude and genuine desire to improve our speciality organisation, the care we give to all our patients. The last months in particular have really demonstrated just how cohesive urology and can be, providing with very short notice, sensible, practical inform information to our patients and members. The qualities shown by those who have asked to work on something have been truly remarkable. There are many people I would like to thank, too many to mention by name, but here are a few. Trustees, phenomenal hard work and commitment, especially in the COVID crisis and over the last two years, have kept me on my toes and challenged when needed and truly a team effort and whose support I come to manage to do my job without. The section chairs have been superb go-to resources and expertise that marshaled their sections with finesse and skill. The council members, all members of the council, regional, regional representatives and the other members of council have been fantastic 
providing reality checks, robust debate, and a barometer to what our members really feel about the higher echelons of BAUS. The tremendous and unwavering support of our Chief Executive and Bishop, DCEO Trish Hagen, and all the BAUS staff, past and present, in very atypical and difficult times, has been really appreciated. Thank you. The generosity and friendliness shown at all the regional meetings uh, has been overwhelming, and in the final analysis, it's all about people. And these are a few people who I'm sure you recognize who all contributed tremendously. The last couple of years could not have been possible without support of my colleagues in Leicester, both in the departments and the university. They borne my absences with, gr with good gr grace and flexibility. Thank you to them. I also wish to thank my now grown up family for bearing with my clinical absences from home, foreign travel and numerous evenings and weekends writing and preparing for talks and meetings. And finally, last but not least, my wife of 31 years, Claire, who has truly been a great support and lastly, a very skilled and diplomatic traveling companion to various international meetings. The last 15 years have been a great journey with some lows, but far exceeded and outweighed by the many highs. And I would like to finally say and comment that urology is a fantastic speciality it's a good career choice and it still has a sense of fun. Thank you for all your support over the last two years, particularly in the first half of 2020, and for all your kind messages, support and appreciation. It really has been an honour to serve as your president. I sincerely hope that all the future presidents of BAUS enjoy the challenge as much as I did. I'm now going to take this presidential medal off and I was going to hand it to Tim personally on the stage in Birmingham, but this will have to do. Thank you very much indeed.